Um, thanks for having me here, guys. So we're gonna go from drones to dogs. Uh, who has a dog or a cat or has had one in this room? All right, we're actually underrepresenting the population. About two in three households in the US have pets. Um, before I dive in though, uh, just a little bit about uh, Whistle. Uh, we are a, we're really the leader in the, the, the category, new category of smart products for pet owners. So many of you will probably say, well, what does that mean? And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, we've been around about three years. We got started in 2012. We're at 50 employees now in San Francisco and San Diego. Uh, we've raised about 25 million and we just uh, closed an acquisition of our largest competitor in January, which is always an interesting twist for an early startup to do. But um, uh, a little bit about myself, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Whistle. I oversee mostly product, marketing, design, finance, support, so a bunch of things. But, uh, mostly focus on marketing and product, and lately I've spent a lot of time thinking about the psychology of our customers and how people think about connected devices and specifically our products, and we'll, we'll go into that a little bit today. Is this uh, clicking over? You can use this. It's easier. All right. All right, so how many people here are, would, would consider themselves building hardware today? a few, so uh, not typically I get to be in a room with a bunch of people who are sort of in the hardware world, so it's pretty fun for me. It's a little bit of a cult slash sort of some camaraderie to it. Um, and I've spent a lot of time talking to other entrepreneurs in the hardware space around a few things, specifically on the consumer side, um, around how people think about um, you know, the products that they build. And specifically, this question of what you're building, actually, what, what is it that's creating value uh, when you're building a connected device. There's a lot of lingo, a lot of words that we throw around. Um, but really the question of where, what's deriving value for, for your customers, for your industry, for, for you as a company. And then really how do you know if you're gonna be successful? Um, how do you know that you're doing the right thing? And, uh, and that's what we'll talk about a little bit today. I think um, there's a bunch of different ways this can go, right? Maybe the device, you sell a lot of it, there's a lot of revenue associated with it. You build a big brand portfolio of products, maybe like a job owner, a Fitbit. Um, a lot of companies like to talk about data. I think that that is uh, an overused term, and it's one that I think a lot of times companies meet us and say, oh, you guys have all this interesting data around pets that nobody else has. Uh, there's 80 million dogs in the US, for example, 90 million cats, it's a $60 billion market. You have all this amazing data. I'm actually not that excited about the data that we have. Um, and then there's others who are maybe talking about the platform, and that's something that we get really, really excited about. Um, but I think different companies have different priorities and different strategic initiatives that they're pursuing in terms of you know, generating value and growing, right? Um, the most important question, I think, that any company building specifically consumer products needs to be asking is why are people buying your product? And a very different question, why are people using your product? And this is, if I could sum up the last three years in two questions of what I've learned, building whistles, these two questions right here. And we'll walk through a few examples of, you know, I think it will help shed light on what, what this actually means. Um, but I think if you can answer these two questions for a product that you're building, uh, you're probably on the right track. And I think it's important to tie it back to ultimately what's the, the goal of where the value resides. But there's no platform, there's no data, there's no broad portfolio of devices if you can't answer these two, right? Most importantly, uh, the only way to figure this out is if you're listening. Um, this isn't a, we had this great idea, we found this need, we found a use case, we're in a, in a room by ourselves, and everybody knows that it's all about testing and research, but really listening carefully to the subtlety of why is somebody buying a product versus why is somebody using it is really, really important. And I think specifically with hardware, even more critical. You know, building hardware takes a long time, it's a lot of money, it's very hard to say, oh, we, we just you know, tweaked it, released a new app, and, and we're done, right? I think it's, you gotta get this stuff right. So this is an example that I, is very close to my heart. I'm type one diabetic, and it's actually informed a lot of what we built at Whistle, uh, probably surprising the most. For those of you that aren't familiar with what's on the screen, at the top is a report that a continuous glucose sensor spits out. So there's a company called Dexcom, which is probably the leader in this space of continuous glucose monitoring. Um, it actually attaches to a sensor that is subcutaneous, uh, tracks your blood sugar every five minutes, sends it to this receiver, eventually to your cell phone, but thanks to the FDA, there are a few years behind. So the device looks like, on the bottom, you can imagine all you really need there is a graph 
an arrow telling you if you're going up or down, and a number that tells you where you're at right now. Up top is a very detailed one page out of a 12 page PDF printout that you get every time you ask for data from this device from their software platform. So if someone is either investing in or working in this space, they might find a lot of excitement in that top piece, right? But as a diabetic, someone who lives and dies by this condition and spends 24 seven worrying about it, I couldn't care less about that top graph. I print that out once every six months when I go to the doctor and I don't even really look at it. The one on the bottom I check maybe 50 to 100 times a day. And so I think that there's a really interesting learning there that we've applied to Whistle. When someone tells me, oh, you guys are building all these analytics for dogs, and it sounds ridiculous, right? Because it is. Who wants analytics for their dog? That's not what we're building. What we're building is something very different. We're trying to understand the psychology of the pet owner, tap into the behavior, change their behavior, and then build a lot of things on top of that. And we'll go into more of what we're building later. But I think this is a really interesting example. Maybe even more interesting one is, is the Apple Watch. Uh, obviously very timely, I think shipping this week. And I think what does it sell, a million in the first 24 hours, 20 million in, in, uh, being built this year alone. And the reason I take these two screenshots is I think it actually embodies on one side a feature that maybe they're marketing. I remember when they were first marketing the product, this was on their homepage, the heart rate, sorry, the heart rate specifically, was on the homepage, it was in the keynote, um, it was a big image, I think, if you remember when it first launched. You can't really find that anywhere now. I don't even think they're shipping with it. What's important to know is why are people going to use the Apple Watch? It may or may not be successful, but I mean, if you're building 20 million units and you've, got, you've sold that many pretty quickly in your Apple these days, you're probably going to be successful with almost anything you touch. But we'll see if it becomes a category or not. But more importantly, people are going to use it. And I think it's because of what's on the right-hand side, not what's on the left-hand side. And the left-hand side is what a lot of people are excited about, though. No one, you know, when Tim Cook is on stage, he's not saying, hey guys, we have this new product with a new screen for you to get addicted to. We're really excited about it. Um, they're going to talk about this cool new feature of tracking your heartbeat and sending your heartbeat to your friend and all these things that, quite frankly, probably no one's going to use, but they're great marketing tools. Now, is the idea here, let's bifurcate our marketing message from what people use? No, but you need to understand that they are different things. So turning to Whistle a little bit and talking about pets um, in terms of why we even went into the pet space, um, I'll actually go to the next slide. Um, so our co-founding team is myself, uh, Ben Jacobs is our CEO, and Kevin Lloyd our CTO. The three of us had sort of an interesting intersection in tech and pets, which seems sort of like a strange intersection, but that's life. Um, so we. Uh, ben and I actually met at Bain doing consulting, and we both moved up to the Bay Area to do investing later in mostly software companies. Um, but it spent some time working on hardware, specifically Dell, uh, when we were in our, our consulting days. Um, we also spent a lot of time in the CPG space with, with the pet industry. And I think, as uh, quite frankly, all three of us are pet lovers. I've had dogs my whole life, so I was Ben. Kevin's a little bit weirder and has cats, but it's okay. Um, but uh, at Bain, we spent a lot of time working with a number of different pet clients. And we very quickly realized, one, how massive the industry was, and two, how absolutely outdated it was in terms of zero technology, no brands that really resonate with consumers today, but specifically that piece around technology. And not technology for technology's sake, but technology for a much bigger vision. But before we get into that, I think just to, again, reset the expectations around like what, what this space is, um, pretty much most households in the US have some sort of pet. 60% have a dog or a cat. They spend a ton of money on them. More and more, the humanization of pet has made people look at their pets as members of the family. And that's led to a lot of different changes in terms of how people buy products and how they interact with other services around their pets. Also, a really important number that, quite frankly, we didn't pay enough attention to early on is the 10 million dogs get lost every year. So 10 out of 80 get lost for a period of 24 hours or more every single year. As you can imagine, out of all the things that could happen to your pet, that's probably the single most traumatic event that would happen. And so one in three dogs get lost in their lifetime, and it's a lot of people going through this really horrible experience of losing their pet. So when we recognized, one, that we all had sort of this passion in common for, for pets, all this experience, we had all these connections in the, in the space, we knew it pretty well. What we sat down and tried to figure out was what's interesting here, what can we build that will really change the, the dynamic of the entire sh of this industry, how pet owners interact with vets, how they interact with brands, how retailers interact with their customers. 
And so we, we created this vision of basically all of the different elements of your pet's life surrounding this connected community of pet owners. And you know, connected meaning engaged, connected meaning communicating with one another, but connected digitally through some sort of product that would capture their attention. We actually didn't really want to build hardware until Kevin convinced us to, but jokes aside, we, we really didn't want to build hardware. Hardware is not easy. Um, we wanted to build just a, a platform. And what we quickly realized was if you want to build something for someone that they're going to be addicted to, kind of like I was talking about with the glucose sensor for a diabetic, you've got to have something very personal, very meaningful to someone that you can pull up into an app. It's constantly changing. It's one thing to build BuzzFeed for pets. It's very effective. Uh, one company, BarkBox, here in New York that we respect tremendously has done an incredible job. Within a year, built the largest, uh, highest traffic pet property in the world within a year, beating out things like everyone knows, like Animal Planet and other sites like that. Um, but we were more interested in sort of how do we build a relationship with a consumer. No, no single company in the entire pet space actually had a relationship with a pet owner. The closest thing they had was maybe an email address. And so we said, how can we build a product that engages a pet owner, builds a relationship with them, and then earns us the right to then talk to them about other things, what they're buying, what services they're using. And so we decided to start on the left side, where you see the blue. And we specifically focused on activity because we thought it was, one, it was really interesting to see what was happening on the human side. And the fact that the data is constantly changing and there's a lot of learnings we've taken from people like BJ Fogg and Near IL who focus on behavior change. And I think hardware products are especially well suited for behavior change. Um, but specifically around how to, you know, there's a, there's a mechanism of reward and variability, um, and the activities seem pretty well suited for that. And so we said, okay, we've, we've aligned this idea of engagement with this platform, and we're going to tie it to an app, and we're going to drive this relationship. And then we'll earn the right to do other things, whether it's safety and going to GPS, which we knew was a need state, but we said, well, you've got to, it's a very complicated product. You've got to build a cellular enabled device with a GPS antenna, et cetera. Um, sorry, GPS chip and, and multiple antennas. And on the right side is all the traditional parts of the industry that we thought we could sort of disintermediate and, and go direct to and have you talk to the vet through a whistle product or talk to uh, a retailer. So we decided to build the activity monitor, which was our first product. And it was really centered around engagement. And we were solving for that, well, what are people going to use and why are they going to use it? And we really focused on that. And we sort of assumed that if we build for that, then, then they'll buy it, right? So we first started with blue data loggers. That's my dog, Sasha, and Ben's dog, Duke. We took these blue data loggers, USB stick, um, collected a ton of data, hired our first employee who was a, a PhD out of Purdue, data scientist, and we started developing algorithms to understand different types of activity, ranging from the early detection of osteoarthritis, detecting seizures, to just daily walks in the park. Um, it ended up leading to this, which is a lot more complicated. Uh, that has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth um, as the core wireless sensors, and even there we were listening to customers in terms of what they needed. Um, you know, they wanted to check in on their dog when they were away. But just going back to this last slide, even just these data loggers, which didn't have any wireless capabilities, couldn't actually transmit any data to anything. We were just greedily taking all the data when they sent the devices back and gave nothing back to the people who were testing for us. But we had a lot of anecdotal stories of people putting the logger on, on their dog and immediately changing their behavior, taking their dog out more, leaving the shades open when they go to work. Just all of a sudden there was an awareness that was created. And so that sort of set off some light bulbs for us around, we're doing something right here in terms of changing behavior and driving engagement. And so hardware is hard, software is a lot easier, but doing both is obviously very hard. And, and I call it magic because it's pretty cool when you've got these two things communicating and not a lot of people do it well. Um, we've taken a lot of pride in designing the front end of this experience to be really beautiful and, and again, going back to the word engaging, very engaging. Um, and we nailed that, that piece of engagement. So we were able to solve for it again. If you go back to my two questions of why does somebody buy your product, why does somebody use your product, we got number two, you know, I think we achieved it um, and, and did a pretty effective job of driving that engagement. So this is, uh, you know, obviously hit some of the data here, but just to explain it at a high level, shows you the frequency, each color represents how often someone is checking the app by week. And so you can see sort of over many weeks after someone starts using the product, how often they're checking. And so we have about one in two users checking the app every single day, and one in three are checking multiple times a day. So very, very sticky behavior. This is many weeks out after starting to use the product. It's about 2x what we've seen. We know some of the guys on the human side um, it's about two actually we've seen with, with some of those guys. And it's really interesting to think again about the psychology of why is that occurring. 
something interesting about when you're tracking something that is not yourself. When you're tracking something you can't communicate with, it's away from you, uh, you care about it emotionally. And customers love the product. There was a lot of great stories here on how people changed their behavior. They, they themselves lost weight. They got their dogs healthier. It was fun and engaging for the family. Um, press loved the product. Uh, I think this quote in particular like really captured it. And, and uh, we get this feedback and we're thinking this is great. We're nailing it. We just need to build awareness and people are gonna love this product. And they, and, you know, they do love it. We're gonna get more and more of it out there. Um, Every retailer wanted the product. We launched a PetSmart, Brookstone, Amazon, and Apple store within a few months in 2014. But then there was this huge moment where we realized there are a ton of people who are our core audience who are not buying this product. And it was actually very obvious, but we continued to sort of think, well, we know what they want. We're gonna drive them towards this product. And there were a lot of people who come into even Brookstone, we heard many times, going to the Brookstone store once, twice, even three times, intrigued by the product, but that immediate obvious need state wasn't there. Of, I really need this, or it's so obvious to me, I get it. It was sort of like, it sounds really cool, I don't know if I need it, my friend has it, they love it, do I need it? And as a small company, when you're first growing, if you're trying to lean really heavily in that number two piece, it's really tough. And we, we start, once you have that sort of eye-opening, okay, wait a second, we're staring at something, it's really obvious, I mean, it was literally everywhere. Every, every store associated in all the retail stores was giving us this feedback. A lot of reviews on Amazon and, and, the, and, and, and the App Store very clearly laid out GPS. I want GPS. It wasn't anything else. Like, I like the product, but it's missing GPS. Or I'm not going to buy the product because it doesn't have GPS. And so there was an obvious learning there for us, which was just people understand it. Like, if you tell someone, I'm going to put a device on a dog, they may say, oh, it has GPS, right? And we say, oh no, there's this other thing, it's activity, it's cooler. And they're like, okay, I get it, but like, why don't you have GPS? Like, it's really obvious. And again, if you go back to like the most emotional need state that exists, that's already there, and we have the statistics to show it, it was very obvious. More importantly, people were willing to pay for it. And we learned that because we did a couple things. When we realized this, and again, as a hardware company, it's very hard to just pivot. It's not like, hey, in the next sprint, let's build in these new features, let's test it in beta and roll it out in a month. We sort of said, well, now what do we do? Right? We've been building our second generation product, which was going to build GPS, but at a much slower pace. We were using it. We were using these new wireless technologies, um, kind of Internet of Things specific wireless networks. One was called Sigfox. There were a few others, like Helium. I think Helium actually spoke here. Um, really awesome companies building very cool technology that we're really excited to use, but they're still probably a year to two, three years away from rolling out across the country in a way where you could tell a customer, if you lose your dog, we're going to find them. And that's really important for us, is that service level agreement, right? Like, companies like Tile that are building interesting things around loss, but it's more like if I lose my keys in this room, I can find them, but if my dog runs away and he's a mile away, I'm never gonna find him with a Tile, right? So there's a certain degree of just service level that we have to provide. So we said, okay, well, we need this product yesterday. And we decided to do a pre-order campaign for the product that we were building just to understand demand. We didn't charge credit cards, and it blew up. So now the problem is even bigger. Now it's really staring us in the face. We've got to be complete idiots if we're going to just ignore this and keep going in our, in our direction. So we started looking at the market. There was this one company called Tag that was a Qualcomm subsidiary originally, had shipped a ton of product, had a bunch of active customers, but was a brand that probably none of us would have wanted to touch. Um, you know, it was it come out of Qualcomm having invested, I think Qualcomm invested close you know, tens of millions of dollars, they had 80 engineers working on it at one point. So a lot of great technology, but seemed very scary to start up. But we decided to reach out to them, and, and this is what we saw. So coming from investing before, I apologize, I'm very into sort of cohort curves and churn and, and retention, and I think those are really important for, for any device company, especially if you have a service on top of it. Um, so what we saw was people, it was very, very sticky. And this was not just engagement. Now, this is people paying $10 a month on average over many, many days in this graph. So decided to go ahead and acquire that company. And again, the goal of it was we realized that there was this very obvious value proposition at the time of the purchase. So this wasn't about trying to convince somebody of anything. It was a latent need solving for that. Why are people buying the product? And if we can combine it with what we've been building, which was a platform around engagement, around why people use the product, that we had something pretty compelling. And we actually use the term internally, rather than say app-enabled app device, we actually like to say device-enabled app, because that's really what we're building. 
I don't care what device we build going forward. Whatever the right technology is, the best technology that allows us to provide the best product that addresses those needs that I've been talking about, we'll build it, but the app is everything. And so I think that the big lesson for everybody building products, again, specifically consumer products, is very different for B2B. If you're building a consumer product, especially if there's an upfront purchase, so this is, again, why it applies really, I think, much more so to hardware companies or connected device companies. Just because people want your product doesn't mean everyone's gonna use it. Just because people use your product doesn't mean everybody will buy it. And without those two, it's very hard. You can convince anybody of, you know, an investor or a strategic partner why a platform is interesting or how you're aggregating a bunch of big data in, in your own vertical. But without these two, I think it's very hard to succeed. So thanks for having me. Hopefully that was insightful and happy to uh, chat about anything related to pets, hardware, or any acquiring customer, uh, acquiring companies as a series they start up. Um, so thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, one question for me: the uh, industry story around retail, you mentioned about retail. Just love you guys, but uh, from being in this space, I know that the reality is also more complex. Any, anything worth sharing? Just in terms of launching in retail and. Yeah, what, what worked, um, yeah. what didn't work? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think the single biggest lesson in retail is, and this is very hard to accept, is retail is not meant to build awareness. Um, I think Amazon actually taught me that more than anybody because they explicitly said it, and I'll tell you that in a second. But um, retail is really meant to expand your distribution and awareness that you already have. And so when you have sort of latent demand and people are searching for you but they're not finding you online or there's a lot more momentum, uh, you open up doors, and you have to think of it as literally opening up doors and not as driving more awareness. Um, because when you put a product on the shelf nobody knows about, it, it's just that much harder for, for them to buy. Um, and specifically for us, we thought there was a lot of strategic alignment with PetSmart, obviously. One of the largest retailers last year was the largest LBO in the US. Made a ton of sense, 1,200 stores. They had nothing like this in the store. The CEO of PetSmart flew, into our, flew down to our office, spent multiple days with us. They were incredibly excited. They have you know, a very difficult time retaining you know, mostly high school age, college age kids who work in the stores who churn out every couple months. They, they're more used to and accustomed to selling a different bag of food versus trying to understand what this product was. So we would go into the store across the street from PetSmart and headquarters and go to the store manager and ask what, you know, if, they, if they had whistle and they say, I don't really know what it is. And we tell them what it is and they say, oh, that sounds awesome. We're like, well, you have it. It's really, right really behind you. And so understanding um, if the retail channel is actually able to execute is one, and two, whether you're ready for retail is another. Like Brookstone was a great channel for us, a great gift product, really educated workforce. Um, but again, it was, it was less about driving awareness through retail and more executing and helping fulfill the demand that existed. And Amazon actually said this specifically to us on the call. We called them early on and we said, hey, we're really excited to launch with you guys. We want to get on the platform soon. They're like, we're going to wait until there's more demand for the product. We're like, how do you guys know you don't have the product? And they're like, we can see just through search, right? Amazon is this incredible SEO retail model. And so there's like, once there's more demand, and there was at some point later in the year, they reached out and said, okay, now we're ready to basically take your demand. And it's essentially taking it out of our own pocket, right? It's a pretty brilliant model. Um, but yeah, retail is still pretty slow, for sure. You gotta be careful, but it's a powerful one once you're ready. How did you uh, make the case uh, as a CEO a company to acquire HAG? And then how did you convince your investors and how do you structure that uh, like transaction? Yeah. It's a big game of chicken. <laughs> um, no, I think that you know, all the stuff that we were talking about around just the evidence was so clear on the need state for the product. And then the economics were incredible. I mean, this is where, if you can find a model where there is service, I mean, Dropcam is this incredible business model that we really admired, an incredible company and team, but also just the business model is amazing, where you've got, you're really becoming a service, uh, service company, and the hardware is essentially almost like any other cost of acquisition for any software company. It's a lot more complicated, but if you can get to a point where the model makes so much sense, where you can drive really high LTV, really high margin revenue on the back end, um, it's really compelling. And so we had the data, we had the economic model built out pretty in detail. And you know, we were already raising money. It was an, sort of an add-on to that fundraise. And we were in a position of strength at that point because we 
had the support financially. And um, it was really complimentary. I mean, it was a Qualcomm backed company, really good technology, but no software internally, no design. I mean, they didn't have a designer, they didn't have a single mobile developer in house. And we were sort of the opposite. We, you know, new company, had, didn't have 80 Qualcomm engineers working on it, but really focused on design and had really scrappy hardware resources that could work efficiently, much more efficiently than Qualcomm could. But um, it's tough. I mean, it, we're now going through a post merger integration, and that's not something most companies at you know, 25 people, which is the size we were at before, are going through. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, oh, sure, I'll repeat the question. So the question is around form factor in terms of one, uh, making it, it has to fit comfortably on a dog, and I'll, I want to address that first. But then also, um, just in terms of shrinking it down and getting it all, all the, the right pieces to fit, um, specifically the battery and other things. Um, so the first one's interesting. I think that um, what's interesting about our market is we're actually selling the customer is the pet owner, right? The dog has no idea. I mean, the dog doesn't care if it's, you know, really nice looking device, if it has a metal cap or a plastic cap, they don't care. Um, and so when we have customers to tell us, oh, the device is too big for my dog, we say, well, it's too big for you, uh, optically. But the form factor is huge, for sure. I mean, people right now compare our GPS product to a microchip, which gets inserted, you know, in, implanted under the skin, which is not the same. It's, if someone has to find the dog, take him to the shelter, get scanned, your information has to be in the database. Very different product, um, but that's what people are comparing it to. So when you have a really big, clunky device on the dog's collar, it is a hindrance to sales. Um, in terms of shrinking down the size, I mean, that's where we, we had a relatively large firmware team that was very focused on battery optimization and being really intelligent about how we're sending data and when we're sending data. Sending data. I think that people underestimate how much complexity there is around just even figuring out the architecture and the right way in which you want to send data and how much of it and how do you compress it and where do you compress it. Like the fidelity of the data, we have basically two streams of two different firmware versions, one which we use for more medical oriented research, like some of the stuff I was talking about, seizures and whatnot, because we have to capture a lot more data. We capture about a thousand times the amount of data that Jawbone does, just to give you an idea. Is that necessary? No, it's not helping people buy the product, it's not helping people use the product. And we learned that. It was really fun early on, and now we realize there's actually some very valuable uh, reasons for us to continue doing that for pharma companies and other stuff like that. But once you figure out the right data model, then you can take a lot less data, less storage. Um, battery life is by far the single biggest thing, and that's the single biggest driver of size that is preventing us from having really small form factor electronics is battery, as I'm sure many of you guys know, battery technology is just not evolving at the pace that everything else is. I mean, I think even since we first designed the activity monitor, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips have gotten like 30% smaller than when we first designed it, and that wasn't that long ago. And that, those are, I mean, the, our Wi-Fi chip, we use the Theros, it's pretty big. Um, so as those, as those components continue to shrink down, uh, the device will get a lot smaller. The, the biggest complexity for especially for our GPS product is the antenna, and that's where you need really, really intelligent antenna design just because of ground planes and overall surface area that you have to cover. Um, otherwise, things are getting pretty small. What's it, say it again? What's to prevent people using your technology of tools? Nothing, go for it. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh, the question was, what is it, uh, what's preventing people from using our technology for humans? Um, this is probably biased for me saying this just because I'm so much more on the product and marketing side, but in the psychology side, what we've built is less the technology and more the platform, right? And an experience for a pet owner. The technology is not that crazy hard. What makes it unique to us is, I mean, for example, you would never want a, a Wi-Fi device for a human, right? Wi-Fi for us is specific to your dogs at home, you're away, how do you get data off of the device so that you can see it? If you wanted to use that for a human, you could, but you have worse battery life, bigger form factor, more expensive bomb. So it just doesn't make sense. And that's where it's like small subtleties that seem, like at, at the surface level, you'd say activity tracker or GPS locator, 
you know, makes sense, like I could use that for a human, right? But you know, on the GPS side, for example, there's a certain architecture we use also that's really specific to like a base station and a safe zone. And I think there are other verticals that we do think about. It would be a stretch for us to go into them anytime soon, but where it would make sense to take our technology, specifically in the GPS side, there's just a lot more complex technology that we would love to leverage if there's opportunities, but we don't want to be distracted. And at the end of the day, we are through and through a pet company. Um, we think that's really important to have that focus. All right, that's uh, all the time we have. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you.